So today we're going to really focus on some of the, the things I do to keep um, my honeybees healthy and, and things just to help for their survival. So as Heidi mentioned, uh, my background is actually in animal and meat science. And um, I actually got into beekeeping because it was seen as a need within my community on a needs assessment for just beekeeping and pollinators in general. So I am just a second year beekeeper, so I'm pretty new to the whole thing, but um, I've had some unique experiences in that time. And just for reference, I am located in Northern Nevada. So just about 30 miles, 60 from Reno, right on the California border here. I do currently have six hives. We'll see how they overwinter. Um, my mentor, Dr. Del Barber and I started the Douglas County Bee and Pollinator Club last year, and it went really well. We met once a month. And then as a result, we decided to kick off and start the Douglas County 4-H Bee Club this year. So we've got about 10 families enrolled in that, and we'll see how that goes working um, with a lot more youth than we have before. So it'll be fun. So let's begin. Um, what I'm going to cover today or talk about is a little bit of what your goals are, um, the importance of, I think, finding a club or a mentor to help through the process, apiary consideration, some pests that you may want to think about. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes, and you'll see what I've dealt with. Uh, mites, of course, the varroa mites, smoke. Uh, in northern Nevada, we've had a a couple of years of pretty bad smoke and how that can impact the bees and then just forage in general. So um, when beekeepers begin the, the concept of wanting to keep bees or, you know, maybe you get into it and this changes as you go. And of course, people always want the products from the hive. So the honey, the wax, maybe the pollen, the propolis, some of those things. Some people want to do it just to create more pollinators and pollinator habitat and just help with the overall concept of um, being able to help pollinate the foods that we eat. One in every three bites of food we eat is there because of a pollinator. And that's of course important. Some people just wanna learn a new skill or a hobby. And some people wanna do it as a family activity. So when I started, I had a couple of goals. One of them is our 4-H motto, learn by doing. Beekeeping, you're very much immersed in the process. You're in the hive. Um, it's really hard to be a beekeeper without having a very hands-on approach. Uh, another one was just practicing good animal care and well-being. As and was alluded to in my bio, having an animal science background has been beneficial in transferring over to the beekeeping world. And that, you know, forage is important. Animal health is important. Um, you know, all those things that we don't necessarily think about tie back into all animals, big and small. And then finally, um, I wanted my bees to survive winter. I had heard beekeepers that lost anywhere from, you know, no hives to all of their hives over winter. And so my first goal last winter was just to, can I ensure my bees are healthy enough, strong enough, and have everything that they can to survive winter. And knock on wood, last year I did make it with 100% survival rates. This winter we'll see, the bees were going into the winter in some conditions I hadn't anticipated. And I'll talk about those as we go through the presentation. But overall, um, just setting some goals for yourself and kind of what you wanna do with becoming a beekeeper or if you are a beekeeper, what that looks like. So my first advice is always to find a club or a mentor. And I've been beneficial in finding a great club and a mentor as well that helped us create another club and now expand on our 4-H program. When I first became a beekeeper, I was kind of like a sponge. I just went to all the bee clubs um, January of 2020. So pre-COVID, um, we're offering in-person trainings and classes. And I, I went around the whole region of Northern Nevada and did what I could, learned as much as I could, read some books and felt about as prepared as I could be to begin the process. And then as we all know, um, March of 2020, everything pretty much shut down. So um, I was able to send some pictures and text and you know do some distance learning 
but it was a lot different than, you know, having someone by my side. So good, bad, or indifferent, that's kind of how I began my beekeeping journey. Uh, some of it worked out really well for me, and some things were, didn't, and that's fine too, because this is a process, and hopefully through presentations like this, myself and others out there share what works well and what doesn't. Um, beginning beekeeping, always be ready to try and learn new things, different things. What you do at your apiary may be different than what someone else is doing. And, you know, even what you do in one hive could be different from hive to hive, just depending on the temperament of the bees or some of that stuff. Um, taking classes. These are extremely important, I think, as well, because there's a quote in the beekeeping community that just talks about you ask 10 beekeepers for advice and you're going to get 12 different pieces of information. And that's true because we all have preferences on how we like to do things, what works well for us, what we've tweaked and learned. And so there's just a lot of different ways. There's more than one way to skin the cat is the saying, and that applies here as well. Um, leadership roles. And I put this up here because I think it's important. Um, volunteerism in general is always important, but if you have a club that you're in and um, they're looking for officers, they're looking for mentors, these roles are valuable. So whether it's to the youth in the community or other beekeepers, if you can fill this need, um, that's always much appreciated. And then finally, just challenge yourself. Beekeeping presents a lot of unique opportunities that um, normally you may or may not ever have in another situation. So it's a lot of fun just to, to go through the experience and see what's happening. Um, again, just to, to remind everybody about the online or in-person learning opportunities, a lot of local clubs offer different sessions. I know for us with the Douglas County Bee and Pollinator Club, we actually meet on a Saturday. So we can go out to one of my apiaries and actually get into the hive. People can, I have some extra equipment and suits so that they can get as close as they feel comfortable. They can actually pull some frames out if they want. Um, I always want people to feel comfortable working with the bees because whatever our mood is and when we work with them, is going to also transfer to the bees. So if you're calm and cool and collected, the bees will feel that. And if you're a nervous wreck and a hot mess, they're also gonna sense that. So just trying to ensure that people are as comfortable as possible. Conferences are starting to come back. So in January, the American Beekeeping Federation is actually coming to Las Vegas. And so if any of you are going, I would love to see you and meet you in person. So hey, say hi if you see me there. Um, there's also still lots of opportunities online as well, webinars, Facebook Lives, YouTube, the Western Apiculture Society has information, several extension programs are doing things. There's also some horticulture outreach programs, so if you're more interested in the pollinator habitat side of things, or to complement the beekeeping, those are great resources as well. And I would just say, always consider the region and the source. So. You know, out here in Nevada, we're the most arid state or the driest state in the country. And so that's going to look a lot different from our friends who live in more humid regions. And then, of course, there's always books, journals, e-newsletters, things like that that are great resources as you begin or build upon your beekeeping journey. So I always throw this in here because um, it's not really funny, but it kind of is because beekeeping is fairly expensive. And I think people get into it and don't always realize the time commitment or the expenses involved. And last year, we just kind of put together a budget. I have a colleague who is an economist. And so we kind of put together some different budgets on what it costs to get involved. And then depending on what your goals were, if you're going to sell products, how much you would have to sell and at what prices to ever break even or if it is going to be more of a hobby adventure. So this is um, just kind of an estimate of some, some equipment I bought and the associated cost with them. Obviously, this has changed a little bit probably over the last couple of years. As we know, supplies have gone up in price and um, shortages. So roughly you know, $1,000 to get started if you buy your bees, if you have to buy all of your equipment, if you can make some of it yourself or repurpose things, it gets a lot cheaper if you can catch swarms, um, make splits. So this is just a rough idea. And I always just like to, to be upfront and honest 
as as much as I can with people about the process. So now the real reason that we're here today is to talk about the honeybee health in general. So as you begin to put together your apiary location, or perhaps you have this and you think through what's working well and what's not, uh, the picture you're seeing on the bottom with the four hives is the apiary that I had first. And um, this is kind of my year one apiary. And then the one above it was a place that we set up in year two. But in year one, the bottom picture, this location, it's on a ranch, and the, the ranchers are trying to be as organic as possible, so they don't use any chemicals, which is nice from a beekeeping perspective. There's lots of trees and shade. One of the challenges they had were a lot of these trees weren't in good health, so the concerns of tree blowing over and taking everything out was a concern, and they did have a, a company come in and take out some of the sick or dead trees to help alleviate those concerns. Um, this one also has in front of the hives, there's two water sources. One is a creek and then the river kind of runs behind the hives. So water is close. And the apiary up at the top, you'll see there's no trees nearby and no shade, which also means there's no wind breaks. So um, this location we've had to adjust a little bit and add some of that ourselves. It's a little more man-made than the, than the bottom picture, but there is also a water source nearby. The river also runs by this location as well. Um, proximity to other hives. So I'm fortunate enough in both of my locations, I don't have um, commercial beekeepers per se. There's not even other hobbyists in the area that would impact my bees. So this is nice from a disease management standpoint. I also don't have to worry about a lot of robbing from other bees. And um, so my bees are, are pretty safe from that aspect. And then I mentioned chemical applications and control. Uh, both of these locations, the, the ranch and ranch owners don't um, do a broad spray to control weeds. It's more the bottom one, they don't do any chemical application at all. The top one, it's more spot treating for some thistle. Um, I know that there's some areas that do mosquito abatement or other pest control type of chemical applications. And so those are always important to keep in mind as well. All right, so I wanna talk about pests. So as you begin this, undoubtedly you're gonna have some sort of pest problem. Um, and if you, if they can exist, I guarantee I've probably had them in some form or fashion. So the first one was ants and I've tried several different things to control ants. <laughs> We're going to try a new one going into year three, cause I don't know, at some point I got to figure out, um, find the best solution. So if we start left to right, um, I was feeding the bees early spring in dearth. So nothing's really blooming yet. And I wanted to provide them with a sugar water just to help get them some nutrients and get going for the year. Obviously ants were attracted there. So I was I had put some diatomaceous earth around both the cinder block stands that I had the sugar water feeders on and around the hives to try to help with ant control. It worked pretty good for ants, but man, those wasps, yellow jackets and hornets sure love my open feeding system here. So um, we got smarter and decided that we were gonna stop feeding those guys and then moved into the middle picture, which is showing more of the entrance type of feeding system where the bees could get out the sugar water and it eliminated some of our other pests. Ants were still a problem. And because the sugar water can kind of be messy, you can kind of see in the picture on that number three hive there, there's a bunch of black specks at the bottom flies became a real problem. So the flies were eating the sugar water that was spilling out. And I don't, I've got to continue to fine tune um, how I feed the sugar water. So what I'm hoping in the last picture, you'll see we kind of put the hives on some hive stands this year as we winterized everything. And I'm hoping that if the ants become or continue to be a problem, that we can actually put those hive stand legs inside cans with some oil or put some grease around the legs to just help keep the ants um, controlled because they can become a problem. 
the, the bees should be able to take care of them if the hive is strong and healthy, but they're just, they're a real nuisance. And even um, once I pulled some honey frames this year, I had a problem with sugar ants. It seemed to just be an ant kind of year for me. So uh, managing ants is definitely something I always continue to struggle with. Um, I've had a heck of a time also with wasps, wasps, hornets, and yellow jackets. And my first year that I didn't put out the, they call it a Y trap, um, early enough in the season. So I put it out kind of late, um, May or June. And I think I was just too late to the, to the table on actually trying to attract the queens. And so last year I started out much earlier, pretty much as soon as the bees started flying, I put several traps around my apiary and make sure I baited them appropriately for the season because according to the directions, and I know we're not always good at reading those type of things, but um, they're attracted to different things throughout the season. So whether it's a savory or sweet type of smell, um, almost an apple cider pungent type of odor, um, it's important to, to what you use to attract them. So this really helped in the beginning, you know, for the first several months toward the fall, um, when we hit that dearth again, when nothing was really blooming and they didn't have much to feed on, they became a problem again. So for me, this was instrumental in trying to keep these at bay. I also realized this year I caught more moths than I ever have before. I haven't really had a wax moth larva problem in the past, but I did catch a lot of them in these traps as well. Anytime I did hive inspections, if I found them, you see one there that's pictured on my telescoping cover, um, I just squished them because I pulled a honey frame and that was a larva that when I brought them back to my office that I discovered a few days later on that honey frame. So I know that I had a, a few of them pop up over the year, but they weren't problematic. And a great way to, you know, if you are concerned about storing any frames or honey frames um, is just to throw them in the freezer and it would kill any potential wax moth larva as well. Chickens, if you do have an extreme outbreak, um, chickens love them. So um, you're a chicken owner and a beekeeper, that works well. So luckily for me, I haven't had a huge wax moth larva problem, but I do try to control those as well. And ironically enough, or not ironic, but interestingly enough, that white trap is very helpful in that for me. Um, spiders, if there's any entomologists on today, they are probably enjoying this one. Black widows at my, one of my locations is insane. I've got a lot of them. Um, I always wear gloves here. I never um, go barehanded just because I don't know where they're gonna be. You'll see, I've got a couple of pictures on the left of where they've been in my telescoping cover. So the black widows, I, I don't have a tolerance for, I usually squish them. If they're a garden spider, I do try to relocate them, but you'll see um, they're not a huge problem as far as taking over a colony, but they're more of a hazard to me as a beekeeper and potentially getting bit by one of them. And so that middle picture, or second one in, um, you can see the spider is eating a bee there and, um, they will you know, enjoy and feast on your bees as well. So I use cinder blocks a lot. They love those spaces. Um, I was doing some feeding out of the, uh, like a five gallon bucket. And I noticed on the right hand side, they started getting underneath the lid there as well. So I just know that if I'm you know, doing a hive inspection or pulling out my screen bottom boards, moving equipment around, I just have to be really careful that um, there's not black widows around, especially if I bring out other people or my son who is four. So, you know, this is just a little bit of a, a hazard to keep in mind. Uh, the next one is snakes, mice, skunks, raccoons, anything else that might want to feed on your bees or what they're, what they're producing. So you can see um, the hive on the left is up on a pallet, but then also cinder blocks. So it's 16 to 20 inches off the ground, which is helpful in just keeping some of those pests out of the hive. But also if you have a skunk 
or raccoon that wants to try to get in there, they sometimes they love to actually scratch on your hive. And as the bees get irritated and come out, they'll just gobble them right up. So this is high enough that it exposes their, their stomach area to potential bee stings and they don't like that. And uh, usually they won't be a problem to the hive. I also have some fencing around the hive, which has helped. A lot of times I would go out to my apiary and it would smell like a skunk. So I'm guessing the skunks tried to go under the fencing, the electric fencing and were shocked and as a result kind of sprayed and as they were startled and left. So that has helped and I'll talk about and the bears here in a minute because that's the real reason that the fence is up. But you can kind of see all of the hives are up and elevated just to, to help with some of that pest problems. Um, and then on the right hand side, I have just a piece of um, hardware cloth over one of my entrances. They also make mouse guards that have little holes in the, the metal as well, but this works for keeping the mice and some other things out in more of a pasture setting. And then of course the bees can still come in and out as they, they freely want to. So bears, I mentioned that um, at both of my apiaries, the hives are near rivers and water bodies, which are also um, places that bears like to be. And especially in wildfire years, we get a lot more of just wildlife movements along the, the river corridors anyway. So um, I had an electric fence up and one morning, one of the ranch owners gives me a call and says, a bear got into the apiary. You know, it's kind of a mess. Do you wanna come over and we'll put it back together? So we go over and you can see in the top left picture there, the fence is smashed down where the bear went in. Um, worked through hive one, knocked over a nuke I had at the end. And then if you look real closely behind that green hive, the bear went out that other side. So I don't know if they, you know, got enough of a shock. If the ranch's dogs, they've got a couple guard dogs alerted them and the bear took off, but it could have been worse than it was. And um, they did get in and do a little bit of damage. And ultimately what we ended up doing is both of the hives that it attacked, um, were small enough after that that we combined them and you'll see the newspaper method there to combine the two smaller ones after that to make one new hive. So we did contact the Nevada Department of Wildlife to come out and see if they could capture this bear and they set up their bear trap and never captured it but what they recommended in addition to the hive I already had out there was to surround the perimeter of my apiary with chicken wire. So as the bear or other critter would stand on the chicken wire with its paws and potentially touch the electric fence with its nose, it would get a shock through its nose and its paws and would leave the area alone. So um, that's what I did. I put chicken wire around it and that could be part of the reason that the skunks <laughs> also haven't been happy and have just been spraying. But uh, so far, knock on wood, it seems to work really well. Um, this ranch has a couple of the guard dogs, as I mentioned, and I think that's also been helping because I know that they have had bears this summer as well, and luckily we haven't had a problem with another bear attack at this apiary. So that's been a, a good feature is just the double um, chicken wire and the, the net fencing here. And you'll see in a minute, I've got a, a, the other apiary tried a different style of fencing, and um, so far the net fencing seems to be the better option for me. Um, cows at my other location have been a real challenge. So this one, we decided to do T-posts with a four strand hot wire and it worked pretty great through the summer. Uh, I had wire failure at some point this fall and I went over to see the bees and check on them and make sure they were okay. And the cows had completely demolished my fence. You can see they knocked over the hives and luckily just that one, not my long, long one there, but um, they did a real number on the whole apiary in general. And so um, as kind of a short-term fix, we just got some panels and then scooched the hives closer together and paneled them in, reinforced it with T-posts and, We'll see, you know, get us through winter with this and reevaluate and reassess what that will look like next year going into spring. Because 
Again, this is along a river corridor where they do have bears, but right now the cows are, are more of a problem and nuisance for me at this location. So I don't know if it was um, the wire fence was my problem and the net would work better, or if I just wasn't getting a good charge on my solar panel, I'm not real sure right now what my problem there was, but um, maybe I also need some sort of a, a double fence method. So fencing is, is needed in the areas I keep bees. I know not everybody needs the fencing or um, it's a needed for your area, but for our area, it's definitely something that I have to have to try to keep my hives as safe as possible. Uh, I wanna, of course, talk about the Varroa destructor mite. So this is a small mite that actually is a big problem for honeybees. It feeds on the blood, it can weaken the colony, it causes several diseases, it can deform their wings and just make them a weak hive, um, ultimately killing them, causing a colony collapse, or they just get so irritated that they actually have spawned trying to figure out how to escape this problem. So in this, the IPM toolbox, if you will, on how to control the mites, I'm a big fan of the screen bottom boards. And I'll show you more what that looks like here in a minute, but it's a great way to monitor what's happening in your hive, the mite presence. Um, if you're treating for mites, how much mite fall or drop there is. So for me, I really love the screen bottom boards. Um, some people have kind of a, a different approach to how they wanna treat their mites. Some like to monitor the threshold and the picture on the left is showing a powder sugar roll that we demonstrated at one of the club meetings. And it's just a way to the bees. There's also the alcohol rubbing alcohol method, which kills all the bees, but it's very effective in knowing what your mite threshold is. The powder sugar method is, um, doesn't necessarily kill all of them, but it's not quite as effective in its accuracy as the alcohol method. But some people prefer to monitor the threshold of the mites in their hive and then treat. Some people have a different approach where they just prefer to treat three or four times a year because they know that the mites are gonna be there and they don't wanna risk it. So um, whatever works out best for everybody, there are different options though. Um, treating with a miticide is one of the options and you can just see up on the, the top picture there, we've got one of the treatments going on the hives and it's important and I've got a, a website here in a minute, I'll show you, but just what your intentions are, what time of year, you know, what you're going to use is going to vary depending on if you've got honey supers on, if you're gonna be collecting the wax for wax products. So there's some handy tools that you can use to help you determine which miticide might be the best depending on what time of year. Uh, the green frame there is called drone comb. So it's a little bit larger than the traditional honeycomb frames that we use in hives. And the intent is that they would build out the wax. The queen would lay drone cells specifically because the mites are attracted to them just because it's a bigger space. The key is to remove these before they actually hatch. So the um, drone eggs are laid and then the mites will go in with the, the grubs and the larva. They'll be cap capped. And then you can pull this drone frame out and freeze it or give it to the chickens again if you're a chicken owner. And it really helps in a more natural way kind of control the mites within the hive. Um, a new one that I just learned about this year is a heat treatment. So one of the members of our beekeeping club is trying this and um, we're kind of interested to see his results. But essentially what it does is it heats the brood area to 107 degrees Fahrenheit. And you do this for two and a half hours. And in two treatments, the company of this product is saying it's at least 95% or more effective in killing or controlling the um, burrowa mites. So this one is obviously another chemical free version. And um, you do have to be so close to a, some sort of power source or be able to provide electricity for this one. So depending on where your apiary is at, could have some limitations on what that would look like. But so far, the member of our club that's using this um, seems to be pretty happy with how it's working. 
So these are the screen bottom boards, and you can kind of see in the top of the picture under the hive there, you have a bottom board under your hive, and this is a little bit different because there's a screen, and then this board catches anything that falls from the hive. So I really like this from a pest management standpoint because I can see um, the varroa mites that are falling. I can see perhaps if there's been some sort of you know, wasps in the hive and there's been a fight because then there's a lot of bee body parts, wings, legs, things like that. Um, if they're getting into their stored honey, you can start to see kind of over on the left, a little bit of the wax chewings that they do to take that off to be able to access the honey. So there's just a lot that you can tell from these screen bottom boards without having to get into your hives. And this is important. Uh, this summer when it was so smoky, my bees were very agitated. So I tried not to open up the hives any more than I absolutely had to. But this was a good way for me to, to know if, you know, hey, there's something going on here. I actually need to open up the hive and look and see. Or everything looks fine. I'm not going to open them up. Um, the great thing about the screen bottom boards also is I was noticing a couple of the wax moth larvae on these boards. So it's just a nice indicator for me to keep track of. I need to come back and check this hive and make sure you know, there's not a bigger infestation or a bigger problem. So uh, the picture on the right, those little kind of shiny dark circles are the varroa mites. So you can see them with the naked eye. Um, if they're on your bees, you can kind of see them as well, depending on where they're at. So they are something that you can see. And this was during one of my mite treatments and this hive had actually a ton of mite drop. So knowing that um, just means I've got to keep an eye on them and monitor them because I know that they might be prone to just having more mites than some of my other hives, which um, don't have near this amount of mite drop. So the mites are, are definitely something that I would recommend you take very seriously as a beekeeper, but there are a lot of different ways to Kind of keep them at bay or control them. Some are more chemical based and some are not. Um, this Honeybee Health Coalition website is the one I was talking about that helps you determine what you might want to do or um, what products you would use in your control of the varroa mites. So if you're not familiar with this, they've got a whole bunch of tools that kind of help walk you through what's happening. Um, in addition to that, they also have some other good resources. So uh, just check this site out if you're not familiar with it yet. And it's just the Honeybee Health Coalition. You can Google it. Um, I talked a little bit about smoke, but smoke was a big problem for us this winter, or this winter, this summer. Um, it pretty much moved into our area in July with some fires, and then we had it for months after that. And you can just see um, how dense it was for weeks on end in the, the picture on the left. And I did feed the bees throughout this time because I know that they were stressed and typically or normally smoke um, as beekeepers we use as a tool to help kind of calm the bees down. It sends them into their hive um, thinking that there might be a fire. So they're going to go eat some of their honey, gorge themselves on it, and they actually are more mellow. But in these cases, the smoke stayed for a long time. And the picture on the right is not a very good one. I took a video actually to send to my mentor because the bees were just flying and angry and really agitated. And uh, so this is just a screen capture from the video. But you can see there's a lot of activity. And they were just, they didn't like the smoke being around for days and weeks on end. And it really got them um, cranky, if you will. So to try to help through that process, I fed them um, a lot of sugar water. Since we are close to water, I didn't put water so close, but one of the options, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting a tickle my throat, is to actually put water on your hive or really near them so they don't have to, to leave to go out into the smoke. But um, just trying to make it as more easy on them as possible. They're not gonna wanna get out and forage as much, they're confused by what's happening. And like us, they just don't like it. Um, I also didn't do any hive inspections during this time because I didn't wanna open up the hive and expose them to more smoke and agitate them even more than they already were. So by watching my screen bottom boards, I knew that none of them had problems. 
Unfortunately, this kind of overlapped when the honey flow for us was. So I was keeping an eye on that to make sure they weren't gonna honey bind themselves and um, cause some problems with space within the hive. So it's kind of a delicate balance on that front. Um, and then of course, forage. Forage is probably one of the most important things is being a beekeeper and just, do you have um, forage that comes early spring and stays through the fall? So the picture on the right isn't mine and I don't know who it came from, but I stole it because I love it. Um, you know, dandelions are one of the first things that bloom, blooms in the spring. And then we saw them here, at least in Northern Nevada again, later this fall. But they provide um, nine out of 10 of the essential amino acids for the honeybees. They're one of the first things that's blooming. And a lot of people want to kill them because they don't like them, but they're actually very, very good for the honeybees and, and different pollinators as we come out of a winter, um, the winter. So um, if, as you think about what to plant or where you would locate a hive, this is all important. You can see the pasture setting hive I have here. We've got a lot of clover, red clover, white clover, yellow clover. There's some alfalfa out there. Um, thistles, he's got a thistle problem, but the <laughs> bees love those. So just a lot of different variety of what, they, what they'll eat um, and to span as long as possible of the growing season. As I mentioned, um, not only did we have wildfire smoke problems, we are also in a severe drought out here in the West. So um, usually that translates to the dearth or just not a lot of forage for the bees, which means that that results in more of us actually having to feed them a sugar water or um, I was out of town for a couple weeks and then that one picture there, I just put mountain camp, which is loose sugar on top so that they do have some sugar to access in addition to their honey stores. I didn't pull a lot of honey this year. I wanted to leave a bunch for them if possible in case they need it, because I know that um, we could have a rough winter ahead of us with just the coldness and, and dry again. And then finally, the picture on the right is sugar boards. So we do make sugar boards every year, the little holes, we had little peppermints in there, those peppermint candies, they love those. So they, those usually get eaten first, but you can see they'll start to go through those pretty quickly. This one, they're eating up through the center of it. And some of the, the larger hives I have, I actually put two of them on to ensure that they have enough food to get through the winter. So I, I have been having to feed the bees quite a bit this year, and I guess it's Lucky for me that I'm just a hobby beekeeper and not trying to make a profession at this because I buy a lot of sugar, more than I want to actually. All right, so um, some of my future plans and what I've kind of got on my radar is just continuing to learn. I've learned a lot, but there's also a lot more that I can learn and a couple areas where I really want to, to focus on learning more is the forage aspect and the pollinator habitat spaces in general, that's probably one of my weaker areas as far as knowledge goes. Uh, this time of year, it's always a great time to make a supply list and a task list and start ordering things now. It seems in the beekeeping world that everybody orders everything at the same time. So I try to stay a season ahead of, of ordering so I can get what I, what I need um, in enough time. And then uh, as we started the 4-H beekeeping club, I just need to work on what that would look like, ordering some extra equipment for that. I do have um, five additional beekeeping suits that I've purchased for our other club. And then um, I'll be purchasing some youth size ones as well, so that if a family cannot is not in a situation to purchase their own, they can use some of ours, some of our equipment, and they don't have to feel like that's a prohibitive of them becoming a beekeeper at some point. Uh, stabilize the fencing. <laughs> Obviously the, the panels are good for, to get us through the winter, but you know, at some point I probably do need to get back to an electric fence. So what that looks like and getting that back in place will be um, just getting the supplies for that. And then my overall goal is to just help our community establish more pollinator habitat in general. So what does that look like? Where can it be done? Are there other groups who want to collaborate on that? 
So lots of fun things. Sometimes I just need more time in a day to get them all done.